Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Mike Westerdahl from criticalbench.com, and um, I've got Vince Del Monte on the line today, and we're going to talk about something that we think really needs to have some attention drawn to it. We're going to talk about tried and true foundational muscle building principles. Now, what we're going to do is look back on some of the old school bodybuilders, some of the guys from the golden era, and get back to some of the roots and foundational muscle building principles. Now, with the internet today, all the forums, everybody doing their Facebook posts, what's happened is there's so much chatter, there's so much noise and static and things getting taken completely out of context online that there's a lot of confusion. And both Vince and I were talking about this the other day. We think people got to get kind of back to basics to some of the old school stuff and remember some of the basic principles that are used over and over again that helps with building muscle. So this, this interview is about building muscle, shape, and size, and getting back to some of those true and tried um, areas. So if you're not familiar with Vince, which I'm, I'm sure you must be if you're any fan of bodybuilding or muscle building information, um, Vince is a best-selling author. He's got multiple books on muscle building, fat loss. He recently won his pro card as a, as a muscle model. And um, he's also a fitness celebrity doing events all over the country. He's got a huge following. So this is a guy who really knows his stuff, and we're honored to have him on the line today. Welcome, uh, Vince. Thanks for, thanks for doing this interview with us. Yeah, of course, man. Looking forward to sharing some great info. Yeah, so just be, we both have our own training philosophies. We, you know, we have some things in common, and we probably have some different opinions on some things. But I was just curious, some of the guys that you studied, you know, as you were coming up when you first got started in uh, lifting and bodybuilding, muscle building, were there any guys that you originally studied that really kind of helped build the foundation of some of your philosophies? I didn't study anybody per se, but I do know the guy I learned everything from probably did because um, for those who um, don't know my story, I got mentored by a guy from my church who was a former pro bodybuilder. He was uh, drug free and um, he, uh, I nicknamed him my skinny guy savior and uh, the way that he trained me now looking back on all the readings of uh, some of the guys we'll talk about, Vince Gerond, Arthur Jones, Mike Menser, Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, many of the principles that were responsible for my uh, initial transformation, even the transformations I, I still put, through my, put my body through, are all basically, as you said, tried and true. They're all irrefutable laws of muscle growth. So uh, you definitely didn't, uh, you know, we definitely didn't get lucky. We were following a science. Yeah, definitely. Do you know, what was that, what was your mentor's name? I've heard you mention him before. Uh, you know what, <laughs> uh, he's actually, um, he's a chiropractor in Guelph, Ontario, but he actually prefers to name Nameless. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, That's uh, cool. I meant to always, uh, you probably, he, he, he probably wouldn't have heard of him, uh, but the um, uh, best way to describe this guy was, um, I mean, he was in his 40s when I met him. He'd be probably in his late 40s now, and he just, uh, he looked better than half the 20-year-olds in the gym. Uh, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So he, so what's looking back, what year when he probably got started, this was probably the, maybe the golden era of bodybuilding, maybe like in the 70s. I mean, this was the time, if you look back, kind of like when Franco Colombo, Dave Draper, Arnold, those guys are all out at Muscle Beach out in Venice. You've been there, haven't you? Haven't you visited that area? I have. It's uh, quite a spectacle. Yeah, it's now it's, uh, now it's a complete disaster. <laughs> oh, man. Let's but I mean, circus. Yeah. If you go look at those pictures of those guys, the physiques are so different than what you see today. It's almost as if like competitive bodybuilding isn't as popular in the mainstream almost as it was back then. Everybody wanted to look like those guys and it was stuff that people really looked up to. And now it's almost become kind of like this little niche hobby to actually be a true bodybuilder, someone that competes in it. But back then it's like everybody wanted to look in shape and look like these guys. You might, what do you think yeah, now, has changed from then to now? I mean, now some of these guys, they're almost too big. Girls look at them and they can almost think it's gross. But you go back and look at the guys from the 50s, 60s, 70s. I mean, I don't know any guys that wouldn't want to look like that. Yeah. No, right now it's kind of a bit of a freak show. That's the best way to describe it. And the uh, best way to describe professional bodybuilding in the state it's at right now is um, – 
I mean, no doubt these guys know how to build muscle. I mean, if you're going to learn from anybody on how to build muscle, the pro bodybuilders know how to apply more intensity to their muscles than anybody else. But at the same time, uh, what you're kind of, I was at the Olympia last weekend, and what you're seeing on stage is basically a spectacle of who's willing to experiment the most with um, extracurricular supplements, let's put it that way, because um, their body, I mean, that's the, that's the only factor that's different in terms of their growth. Compared to what yeah, it's like, back. it just doesn't look look the same anymore. So when do you think that this kind of got, those guys all started learning, they were kind of experimenting with some tried and true foundational muscle building principles, the guys from the golden era, even before that, who were the guys that very first got this started? I mean, wasn't Arthur Jones one of the guys that started the fitness revolution? Yeah. Arthur Jones is really famous. For those who don't know, he's the guy who invented um, the Nautilus line of equipment. It's still around today. And um, he's, famous for, um, he's famous for a saying that uh, says, if you've never vomited from doing a set of barbell curls, wow. <laughs> barbell curls, then I don't, you've never... I don't think I've done that. What's that? I said, I don't think I've ever done that. Yeah, so, so then he says then you've never experienced outright hard work. And uh, I don't fully agree that you need to vomit to experience uh, an effective workout, but that's a really good description of intensity and uh, probably one of the best ones I've heard. So Arthur Jones really challenged a lot of the um, information that was out there, and um, he even um, he submitted a lot of his um, his. Um, his information to the popular magazines back then. I remember um, reading something about him sending it to uh, Strength and Health magazine, which was really famous in the 60s, and he sent it to Joe Weider's Muscle Builder and Power, which has now become Muscle and Fitness, and he never heard any response. And he was one of the first guys who started talking about quit emulating the workouts of the men who are winning the titles. That was his message, and you'll see a lot of you'll see that same message in a lot of my own marketing these days. And um, he would even insult some of the bodybuilders at the time, and he would say stuff like, "Most of these guys can't even spell the word muscle." And um, his um, his writings got accepted by um, the um, the creators of Iron Man magazine, which is still around. And that's when he started to gain his uh, popularity. And um, he really, um, you have to study Arthur Jones, and for those who are really interested in knowing more about his story, there's a book called The New High Intensity Training. That's actually what it's called, The New High Intensity Training, and it's by Eglinton Darden. He talks all about his um, upbringing and everything, and um, Arthur Jones was a really wild guy. He was um, he was always looking for bigger adventures, younger girls, um, <laughs> um <laughs> bigger crocodiles to hunt. He was, he was a wild man and um, he was very, he was a very outside of the box thinker. So that was kind of, uh, when you read his upbringing and his story, you'll see a lot of why he was able to think outside of the box and um, how he was able to contribute so much to bodybuilding when everything was going one direction. So um, he was famous also for training um, a man named Casey Vitor, who uh, was one of the top uh, bodybuilders in the early 70s and who won the Mr. America, and who trained him based on a completely counterintuitive approach to building muscle at the time. So you have to understand that in the early 70s, it wasn't abnormal for a lot of these um, bodybuilders, like a lot of the guys who were training with Arnold, to be training two to three, uh, two to three hours a day and doing double split sessions. So these guys were training twice a day for two to three hours at a time, and that was, kind of, that was the norm. And right. this guy, this this guy Casey, comes along and um, gets trained by Arthur, and um, and he was doing these 27 minute workouts. And his workouts would go from you know lower body to upper body to uh, smaller body parts. And he was doing these one all out sets. And um, the best way for me to describe this kind of workout is, um, for anybody listening, have you ever tried to sprint around the track as fast as you can for 400 meters? It's a, think of like an all-out sprint for 400 meters. For most people on this call, that's probably going to take them 70, probably about, it's hard to say, maybe 70 to 80 seconds. And that's considered um, an all-out effort. And... Um, 
Now, most guys can maybe imagine doing one of those, but imagine doing that 8 to 12 times in a row. With no rest or taking a quick rest? Taking a little rest. So let's say you're taking one to two minutes. Um, yeah, that's, that's crazy. I mean, that would be so hard. Right. So go to the track right now and sprint around the track as fast as you can, then rest for one to two minutes and attempt to do it eight to 12 times. And this was the equivalent of the high intensity training workout that, um, 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 uh, Arthur Jones would put his clients through and um, that's how they would describe their all out sets. So when guys would hear one set on the leg press, one set on the leg extension, one set on the squat, one set on the leg curl, one set on calf raises, one set on pullovers, one set on um, shoulder presses and so forth through the entire body, the effort that they were applying in each one of those sets was the equivalent of you sprinting around the track as fast as possible. Most guys, if they sprinted around the track as fast as possible, they would be lying on the ground for probably 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. So you have to put these all-out workouts in a context. That was the, again, that's the kind of intensity that they are applying during these all-out sets. So now, would really, that go to absolute failure to the point where they can't get the last rep? This would be going to their definition. Um, that's a great question because um, uh, you, you have to put in context what is their definition of intensity. And um, I believe that um, not – sorry, um, Arthur Jones described it as going to momentary failure with proper form. So you're okay. still working within the context of proper form. Now, it's interesting you say within the context because the topic we're talking about is actually muscle building and bodybuilding. Now, some of these same principles we're talking about do not apply to other types of, of training. Let's say, for example, your goal is not muscle building, but you're training for strength, either for a sport or for competing in powerlifting or Olympic lifting. Now you have your nervous system that you need to consider that's part of this. You're not necessarily trying to build bigger muscles. So that's a time when you don't want to train to absolute failure because then you actually can fatigue your nervous system. So that's where I think a lot of people get confused with these principles because they're mixing and matching principles from, from different contexts where we're focusing on muscle building right now, but you've got other tried and true principles for strength and you've got other ones for like sports performance and and things like that so i think people need to pay attention to that they they need to have a clarity of vision here's the problem most guys don't know what they want if you go to the gym he'll tell you three different things that are all they all kind of contradict each other i want size i want i want i want size i want strength and i want to get lean well which one do you want right now so you need to get focused on what your specific goal is and then figure out what, all, what, what are the principles that are completely geared for that goal. So, um, yeah, that's, that's essentially what it is. Yeah, I agree. And, I mean, with some of my other programs like the hybrid training where you combine lots of things, you can advance and, you know, get results in all of them, but you'll always get your best results focusing on one thing. But it is possible to, you know, try to do a lot at once, but you just – if you don't focus on one thing, you're not going to get as fast of results, I don't think. Exactly. I can summarize um, Arthur Jones' hip principle in nine words. It's basically do as many repetitions as possible in good form. Okay. That's what it, that's what it comes down to. Now he has a couple. We can you know he has a couple um, um, principles that can kind of. Um, expand on that because guys are probably wondering, you know, how much weight do I start with? How long do I recover? Um, how, what's the frequency? And uh, that we can touch on that. What kind of range of motion am I doing? So he goes into quite, quite a lot of depth um, with regards to how to apply his style of intensity. Right. I mean, the underlying principle is that you have to stimulate the muscle. When you stimulate your muscle, it has to adapt somehow. Now, there's different ways of stimulating it, and high-intensity training is one of those ways, but there's other bodybuilders that have had great success stimulating the muscle in different ways, say volume training, where you're not going intense, but you're getting a lot more total weight moved in a period of time. 
I mean, that's something to think about too. It's, it's also kind of funny to think about if you go to most commercial gyms nowadays and they have that all out of the Nautilus machines and they have the Nautilus circuit set up where they take one machine per body part and the people kind of go through it. I think it's called like the express lane or line or something. And you see like these moms going through it and they kind of do like eight to 10 reps, kind of just, you know, talking to their friends, barely even focusing on it. And you just go through and do like one set per exercise. That's so not what Arthur Jones had in mind when he came out with the, uh, with the high intensity, one hard set per muscle group. I mean, imagine if you're really, really doing that one set, you probably have three times as many reps in you as you're actually doing. If you can carry on a conversation and not even try that hard. It reminds me of this program too, uh, super squats. And they were telling you your starting weight, pick a weight for squats that you think you can do eight times. All right. Now do it 20 times instead. And you somehow can muster it out with good form. And that's like, right. that's high intensity right there. That one set could be your entire workout just because you did more than double the amount of reps that you normally thought you could do. And you'll be able to do it somehow. Right. So, you know, I think it's important for guys to understand the value of intensity and then to maximize that to the absolute fullest. And I think the reason that this approach was effective for a lot of guys was because it dropped their volume it allowed them to put more effort into these fewer sets, which is able to stimulate more muscle fibers, and they were able to grow. So uh, my whole analogy in how I've kind of made this made sense for guys nowadays with all the information out there is that, um, you know, you've got so many options in terms of setting up your body. You can do... You know, I always favor quality over quantity. So before we do 10 average sets, I'd rather see you do five really high quality sets. And if you haven't exploited that yet, then it doesn't make sense to scale up. So it's kind of like a, t a continuum. Um, ideally, the most number of sets you want to do is one. That would be like the perfect workout, just one set. But as we know, our body adapts to everything. So once we've exploited a one all-out set, then we'd progress to two sets. And then we, once we've exploited two sets, we progress to three sets. So the mistake a lot of guys are doing is they're jumping right into 20 to 24 sets on a body part, and none of them are sufficient enough to create enough breakdown in the tissue for it to, re, to have to regrow. So um, I think the, this, you know, that's, where, that's what no-nonsense muscle building is completely uh, based on. It's based on full-body workouts, high-intense principles, low-volume. Um, but with a high frequency, so you're hitting every muscle group multiple times a week, which is all, which are other principles that they, uh, that Arthur Jones would agree with. So, um, but like you said, that will only work for so long. But the key is to understand, ask yourself, have I exploited low volume and high intensity? Once you have, then you might be a great candidate for a two day split. Yeah, I think you're so right with this. And then exactly, and then once you exploit a two-day split, then you're a great candidate for a three-day split. And then once you right. exploit a three-day split, you're a great candidate for a four-day split. Most guys don't need to um, split their body parts up uh, like a professional bodybuilder does until four or five years into the game. And um, you know the law, and the more the more. Um, Beginners can stimulate. Uh, yeah, I mean that's essentially it. The the, the more intense you go, um, the more recovery time you need. So, the more volume and the more intensity you're applying to the muscle, the more recovery. And that's why they eventually graduate to those one day part body part splits. Which is like another foundational principle that every time you train a muscle, you're tearing it apart. It needs time to recover before you can train it again. And it sounds like kind of a progression that you're talking about, which reminds me of the progressive overload principle, which I think was one of the, one of the weeder principles. But I mean, basically you need to each week try to either do a little bit more weight for the same reps, or you want to try to add a couple more reps and that can work for a really long time. Just like your no nonsense program is based on a lot of those principles. My critical bench program it's the same thing. I mean, it's high intensity. It's not a lot of sets and you know, you're doing the most weight you can And each week. You either just add a little bit of weight or you try to get one or two more reps and this can work for a really long time. 
I mean, maybe like you said, after four years, five years, you start and you've been really working hard, this basic stuff maybe isn't working as well for you. I'm not going to say that progressive overload training is going to work for your entire life forever, but I think it's a great foundational place to start for most people. Then later you might have to mix it up for to hit like the muscle confusion principle. Exactly. So, so the main thing, the main point there, um, you 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 won't be able to always increase your reps and your sets. There'll become a point where you need to maybe add a second exercise, um, add a second day for that uh, muscle group. So that's correct. So uh, you have to understand that y- there's not a complete um, linear progression that never stops. <laughs> right. But I mean, it, I think it can keep going for a while because there's so many things you can do. I mean, you. For the muscle confusion part, I mean, you can try a variation of that exercise that you're doing, and that's enough to just provide a new stimulus. And that's, I mean, there's some debate over the muscle confusion now because of the whole P90X thing. Sometimes it seems like so freaking random, almost like CrossFit too, where they just throw things together like it's a random workout, and then they just call it muscle confusion. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you can't do the exact same thing week after week after week. You need to, you know, vary the exercises, change your reps a little. And there's a lot of different intensity techniques and different kinds of drop sets and giant sets. But, you know, those aren't things that are part of, I think, the foundations. Those are just techniques, the little things that that you can try. It's almost like tactics, versus principles. And if you just stay true to the main principles, these little tactics aren't going to make or break your results. They're just things you can try. Right. So I think the first uh, thing we want to send these guys home with is uh, we touched on increasing reps and sets. I actually call that double progression. So this is one of the ultimate principles you want to strive for. With whatever workout you're following, you want to strive for what we, I guess you could call double progression. And that's where you strive to increase your repetitions first and then resistance. And this will be the the cornerstone of uh, any successful strength training or bodybuilding program. And um, this principle has been applied for more than 100 years. So uh, to get your best results, focus on double progression. And when you combine it with the right intensity and with with proper form, then um, that's one irrefutable principle you need to apply all the time, no matter what program you're doing. And, yeah, I'm glad you touched on the CrossFit and the, and the P90X stuff. They're great, you know, they're programs, and if you fall in the work, but, again, they won't work if you don't apply progression to them. My only caution to people following something that it doesn't have any um, – any kind of measurement built into it is that you can't manage anything. So if you're not improving next week and you're just doing these random workouts, how do you know what to change? It, it turns right. into a, kind of like a shot in the dark and you just start guessing. The nice thing with a bodybuilding program where, you know, even if you're doing something as generic as four sets of 10 across the board, if you're at least keeping track of how much weight you're lifting and you're increasing the weight each week, you're at least, you know, what Vince Girona would describe as honest progress and the rest periods are consistent. You're going to see results and you're going to be able to manage that because you actually can show that, hey, I've increased my weight this much at this amount of volume and this rest period, and you can determine whether you're making progress or not. So uh, when you start just doing 10 different things, a workout, and there's no measurement, then how do you know if you're improving? I mean, you can use the mirror, but if the mirror is not showing any changes and you're not keeping track on paper, then you really don't have any intelligence on whether your program is successful or not. And that's not a place you want to be if you're serious about progressing. Yeah, that's definitely excellent points. And you actually had mentioned earlier, you know, every program is not perfect for everyone. So just because you hear somebody send an email or a Facebook update or something that says this is working really well for them. doesn't mean that that's where you're at in your progression and where you should be starting. They need to explain why it's working and how they've come to that point. Right. I think uh, what Mike and I were talking about earlier was um, 
the internet's getting it's getting very confusing, and most people are are getting educated through other people's Facebook updates, <laughs> right? <laughs> or issues, or and, and there's a lot of uh, people that are sharing how they got ripped, how they built muscle, and their um, their explanation for how it occurred was, well, it worked for me, and our um and, and we were just expressing our frustration with. Uh, you know, having readers who are taking advice from guys like that. And um, we wanted to caution everybody to, I guess, how can you put it bluntly, don't take advice from somebody who can't explain to you the reason behind why they're doing something. Because there is a science to building muscle. There are principles to follow. It's not just a it worked for me approach, or um, which is what it's kind of turning into. So, um, there are rules to follow. There are more effective ways to do an exercise than other exercises based on certain goals. There is something called biomechanics, exercise physiology. Um, and um, it's important to understand that. So if somebody can't give you an in-depth answer to why they're doing something, then, you know, you might want to, uh, you know, just take their advice with a grain of salt. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, we're talking right now just about training and recovery, but part of recovery is nutrition, which is a whole nother can of worms. But I mean, you look at Vince Gironda, he was one of the first guys ever that said nutrition is responsible for 85% of your total results, which I mean, that's huge. <laughs> yeah, well, I was wondering where they got that 80% from, but I was look, thinking about it the other day, and it's probably because we eat four more times than we train, so I guess that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you train for, what, like an hour a day, but you're eating six, seven times a day. Exactly. Which, how did your diet, like, moving into, uh, hold on, i got an ambulance <laughs> driving by the office right now. <laughs> Can you hear that over there? Yeah, I could, yeah, I was having some uh, background noise, too. All right, so... Just looking at your uh, your progress over the last year, I mean, you've made some amazing changes on different ends of the spectrum where you had a mass building phase where I think you were over 220 pounds, maybe close, maybe even, what, 228 or something like that? Yeah, I got that, to 220. Yeah, and that was, um, you know, I think the biggest, one of the biggest you've gotten you had to be eaten a certain way, but then how many months later were you on stage competing at the muscle model competition? So on January the 1st, so actually it was about, um, it was, uh, I think November 1st, I started bulking. I went from 214 to 227. And then on January 1st, when I was 227, I started my um, prep for uh, my show April the 16th. And that was, I believe, I guess that would have been 15 weeks later. I went from 297 down to uh, 195. And 227? 227 to 195. So I went, uh, yeah. there was quite a ways to travel. I mean, when you hear Vince say bulking, it's not like what you picture with these guys that are just eating crappy food and getting fat because he wasn't fat. He definitely was looking good and was big and solid, but that's a whole nother animal from stepping on stage where they're like checking out every muscle striation and stuff like that. So, yeah. I mean, for it wasn't time. like, yeah, it wasn't like he bulked up and got fat. He was, you know, big and, and looking good, but to be stage ready is a whole nother story. So I'm kind of interested in, you know, this is kind of heading a little bit more into your uh, personal thing away from the interview a little bit, but how, how did you eat differently when you um, were getting, was it more the training or was the nutrition really 85% of it? Do you think? I mean, you, you know, must have, I know you were doing like cardio in the morning and high intensity, but how was the eating? It was a lot of factors. It was a lot of factors, Mike. It was, uh, I would consider it a synergistic effect. Um, the first thing I did was, you know, Back in November, I decided I don't want to just compete. I want to remold my body. I literally want to remold my entire physique. I wanted to bring something completely different to the stage. I wanted to be bigger, thicker, fuller, more striated. So I wanted. Um, so I realized it was going to take multiple phases. So I first, I mean, it's important to understand that this occurred in phases. This didn't all occur at once, and that's the um, that's the whole clarity of vision principle. So I first knew I needed to add some size to um, my shoulders, to my arms, 
um, to my upper chest, to my lower lats, um, to my hamstrings, my calves, my lower abs. So there were specific body parts that needed uh, more attention than others. And I discovered that by getting a physique assessment by one of the top professional bodybuilders in the world. And I hired him as my coach. So um, it all started getting another set of eyes on my physique. And I think that's really... That's not something you hear about on the forums because it's something that happens behind behind um, in the background. So for guys who are struggling, they should really get someone to look at their physique because if I look at somebody in the gym, I can tell how they train just by looking at their posture. I can tell the way they lift, how they don't lift, what exercises they do, what exercises they don't do just by looking at them um, standing up in a T-shirt. And my coach is able to do that with me, and he is able to figure out all the areas we need to reconstruct. Yeah, sorry about that. Another ambulance. <laughs> I go down to my office to get away from the baby at home so we can have some quiet, and then we got all this traffic outside. <laughs> um, you there? We have um, yeah, I'm here. Sorry about that. So, okay, so that that's the first step, getting a physique assessment. And um, one sec, are you good? That was the first step, getting a physique assessment and um, customizing a routine to my body, and then um, picking exercises that were that were designed to bring out those body parts. So my chest routine was focused more on the upper chest. Um, my back routine was was focused, you know, my five exercises in my back workout were all dedicated to the lower lats. Um, my whole, my workout routine was split, was built around bringing up my hamstrings and my calves. So I was training those twice a week, you know, before I was only training them once. So, so everything was tailored to me. I think that's really key. For that's guys awesome. Now, do you think you could assess yourself or are you kind of biased when you look at yourself in the mirror? Is it better to have someone else look at you and tell you? You know, you what you see understand. yourself might be different. Exactly. And you need someone who understands anatomy. So, you know, he looked at my hips. You could tell my hips were tight and I was doing too much quad work. And we had to bring balance back to my um, lower back. I need to start stretching my hamstrings and glutes more. And, you know, so there's, there's you, 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 this isn't at the level that when you get to the competition level, it's not as simple as eat, sleep, train. <laughs> so right. you need to take a scientific approach to remolding your body, body and that's what we did. So, I mean, that's what uh, – those are a few aspects from the training standpoint. Um, you know, when it came to nutrition, uh, that was a whole, you know, whole other animal. I'd be happy to share a few. Uh, was there any specific nutrition areas you wanted you think we could help guys on? I was just – I mean, you hear so many different kinds of diets and rotations and things like that. Did you do more so, 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 of so like avoiding sugars food. and chicken salad, water type stuff? Or? Yeah, you, you know, let me give you guys some more. Um, I, can, I mean, we can talk about all the tricks and all that, but I think the mindset is more important when you approach a diet. Um, number one, a lot of guys just have what I call too many chefs in the kitchen. So they're just taking advice from too many guys. And if you really want to get shredded, you need to take advice from one person. And you need to trust that person if, he, if, you've, out, if you've dedicated him as your coach. It's like an uh, airplane pilot. You can't guarantee, you can't ask an airplane pilot, pilot to guarantee you safe arrival. You have to go based on his track record that he's taken thousands of people from point A to point B safely, and they've all got there. So you can't get your coach to guarantee you safe arrival. You have to trust them, and then you do everything he says. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to give yourself enough time. My show was in April. I was starting in April. Uh, I was starting in January, and uh, I had plenty of time if I lost 1% of body fat per week. So a lot of guys back themselves into a corner, and they don't give themselves enough time to lose fat. If you look at my transformation, I lost 1% of body fat per week which isn't anything extreme. That's just considered normal. It took four, four and a half months to do it. That's the only difference. It just took time. Um, a third mindset is to, um, is to be compliant to your program. So a lot of guys are making thoughtless decisions and they're pretending they know 
more than they actually know and they start throwing in a cheat day or a fast day. It's like, well, if those, if those aren't a part of the program, don't add them. If your coach has you doing this, this, and this, do it. That way, at the end of the week, you can look at what you've done, where you've come from, and if you've made a wrong turn, you can figure out where you made it because you've been tracking everything. So you have to track everything as well. I always say what gets measured gets managed. So, um, again, we just, you know, we took a very, um, you know, realistic approach to the prep. And, um, you know, I, I don't mind kicking back a couple you know, cool things that we did that some guys may not have heard of, but with protein intake, we varied our protein intake based on the time of the day. So in the mornings and the nights, we'd have uh, fattier and slower releasing forms of protein like meat or salmon. Around workout times where we needed a faster source of protein, we'd have fish. Um, we would never eat the same protein source more than twice a day. So I was always eating, you know, my typical day would look like red meat and then uh, chicken and then egg whites and then a protein shake and then turkey and then fish and then a different form of meat. So I was putting in a lot of different amino acids in my body. So I was really optimizing absorption and digestion. Um, same rules applied to carbohydrate sources. We, we um, rotated our carb sources. They were timed around workouts. So, um, you know, nothing, probably nothing, not a lot of like secret things guys haven't heard. We just executed everything. Those guys listen to this. If they, if they came up with a plan, they put it into action, they followed to 90%, and they simply um, change, made small changes from week to week based on the progress, they'd get to their destination. That's all we really did. I mean, my meal plan stayed almost the same for the entire 12 weeks. I mean, you know, things that changed were like 8 ounces to 6 ounces, you know. Um, yeah change, you know, Ezekiel cereal to oatmeal and then oatmeal to uh, brown rice and then brown rice to quinoa, then quinoa to um, sweet potatoes. So, you know, we were reducing the gluten kind of foods that were causing my body, uh, that my body's going to be sensitive to. So, you know, things like that. So, um, I mean, that's a lot of just consistency and sticking with the plan, which reminds me of actually a quote I saw from Skip LaCour last week. He said, the best bodybuilding diet is the one that you stick to and follow because you're going to get different advice and strategies from every different person you talk to. And a lot of these will work, but you have to actually stick with it and keep doing it, which that is the hardest part, which comes back to a lot of the mindset tips that you're giving us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, that's interesting. You brought up that, you know, you're, like a fitness professional, best-selling author, have done all these transformations yourself, and you still went out and hired yourself a coach, which mm-hmm. kind of draw, draws me to your uh, Live Large events that you've been doing lately where you shared a lot of these coaches and mentors that you've had with other people. Uh-huh. Like I, I was actually at, out of the country when you had the event, so I missed it, but could you just fill us in real quick on what's going on with that lately? Yeah, well, everybody could um, – actually, I just released the DVDs today. Um, so Live Large was my first two-day seminar that I hosted uh, two days after the World Championships just four weeks ago. And um, basically, it was an opportunity for my um, my readers to uh, travel into uh, Toronto, Ontario and to uh, learn my realistic approach to living large in fitness, business, and life. So um, I uh, brought my three coaches on stage with me. So I have, I call them my all-star lineup. And um, I had my coach, Ben Pikowski. He spoke, uh, him and I both spoke on um, fitness. You know, we talked about new rules to building muscle. We spoke on my contest prep. He talked about big mistakes uh, guys make when trying to gain muscle. I brought in my business coach. And um, I brought in the guy who helped me start my online, um, sorry, my um, start my career in the fitness industry, and really helped me become um, a big player in the fitness industry at an early age. And I brought in my life coach, who is my father. <laughs> my father's a pastor, and uh, he awesome. spoke um, on relationships and, you know, getting a head up, getting a check up from the neck up, and avoiding passion killers and. Um, I even spoke a bit about, I did a presentation on how I started my online fitness business. A lot of people traveled in to hear how 
you know, I arrived on the scene in 2006 as a complete nobody and how I've built my online, um, you know, fitness uh, business to, to the point of where it is today. And a lot of people are interested in, you know, doing something similar in their own life. So it was a really awesome two-day seminar, and uh, people described it as a revival. And, um, and you should have heard the conversations going on in the hallway. People were really, really inspired. They were really renewed. People were leaving with um, a lot of new knowledge in terms of fitness, but also got a lot of tools in terms of how to uh, start their own business or improve their business and um, even areas on relationships and uh, how to uh, really, you know, make good decisions in that whole uh, that whole arena so yeah i saw actually was, some uh, videos that you uh shared you know you know the camera guy just talking to people what they were learning what they liked about it and it was all different kinds of people you had guys girls younger people older people bodybuilders fitness people a mix of everybody and people in the video seemed really really excited like they had some some big changes they were going to go home and just really excited about the whole event and i think the success of this event i mean it's something you wanted to be on stage and share this information but i don't think you realized or knew how big it was actually going to be and it's kind of inspired you to do a few more of these in the near future right yeah i think next year we might tie one into um my coach ben is competing at the arnold classic and uh we might tie one into the arnold so hopefully you can be there too mike and i'll uh, get a bunch of our friends to uh attend that and then we've got um we might do one in florida because uh that's where i live in the winter time and uh there's a lot we had a lot of people ben lives in there as, as well and uh it's a great spot to do an event so we're looking at uh maybe four more next year wow and, that's awesome um, and this is something i just uh you know plan on blowing up i'd love you know one day fill a room with 500 a thousand people like you know anthony robbins does this is going to be the anthony robbins of fitness events let's put it that way but uh, people Sweet. are going to get touched physically, um, and, you know, really, really geared to, you know, anybody, males and females. But um, I think a lot of guys, young guys who want to get into the fitness industry and really want to kind of, kind of uh, what I call author their own movie star lifestyle. When I say that, I just basically mean creating a lifestyle that serves you rather than, uh, you know, you serving it. A lot of people are uh, just kind of going through the motions and, and, uh, you know, not really, you know, don't not really know what their life calling is. I think that's what I figured out at an early age, what my life calling was. And, and I want to share, it didn't just happen by coincidence. It's because of certain people and certain rules and principles I live by. And that's what Live Large is all about, teaching guys how to live outside their comfort zone and and uh, chase down all those far-fetched goals in all areas of their life and uh, to equip them and encourage them and educate them on how to do that. Yeah, it seems we like kind of, we kind of pursuing went, your we passions. Exactly. And then making a living, pursuing your passions, but having your passion being about helping other people too, not like a selfish thing, you know, something Absolutely. you enjoy doing and enjoying helping other people. And that winds up helping you as well. Yeah. I mean, that's the, um, it's ultimately the people who are most successful in life are those who've helped the most people. So the, the bigger problems you can solve the more people you can help and serve, the better off you'll uh, you'll be yourself just as a byproduct. So it's uh, awesome. You know, how, uh, yeah, I'm hoping just this interview is able to help help some people, and I think that's a good way to to wrap things up for for this time. I'm sure we'll we'll do another one real soon and and share it with people. Is there anything else you wanted wanted to mention? Yeah, if people want to follow along with me, the best place to go is just to um, my fan page on Facebook. I've got that. I'm pretty active there, and um, they can get on my, for my free newsletter there, too, so they can learn about these events when I host new ones, and uh, they can uh, make the trip themselves. So um, just, go to, just uh, go to Facebook and type in Vince Del Monte. Look for the public figure. You'll see um, a guy with... I think, I think I'm around, so there's 17,000 fans. There's a lot of fake Vince Delmonis. That's why I'm telling you that. Look for the guy with 17,000 fans. That's me. <laughs> yeah. And um, just look like and um, say hi and uh, let, let us know what you learned from the call. Cool, man. And he's got a TV series, too, the Live Large. Uh, yeah, that's something that's, everyone should check out, too, LiveLargeTV.com. It's probably yeah, the coolest kind of, thing I'm doing right now. Yeah, that's been awesome. People are People are loving those shows. And that's kind of I what the event, event. Yeah. 
I'm enjoying that today myself. <laughs> That's what it's all about, enjoying what you're doing, being passionate about it, and helping people. So yeah. as you're doing right now, thanks a lot. We really appreciate your time and talking with us and sharing your knowledge with everybody. 